All right, AP World. So here's what we're going to do with these video notes. Um, I'm going to start uh, right here with uh, China Gain Strength. Uh, looking at the uh, post-classical era. We, we covered this in class, and I don't know how far we may have, have gotten, but if we, if we took care of, of this business here, um, then obviously you can just kind of fast forward and uh, get yourself to where, where you need to be. Um, and we'll just take it from there. And there's, there's really, there's not much to cover here. And so I'm going to just kind of move through this, uh, fairly quickly. So, uh, post classical, we're going to ship back over to China. Um, when we were last talking about, uh, China, we were, um, dealing with, uh, the Qin and the Han dynasty is kind of back during the classical era, but now we're past that. Um, I stretch off a little bit about the, uh, the Sui dynasty. Yeah, that's how you pronounce that. Sui. Okay. And, uh, and so the Sui dynasty, um, that, uh, is, is one of those that, uh, this, this comes in after the Han dynasty. And, uh, when the, the Han dynasty fell, uh, China fell into a little bit of, uh, a little bit of disunity and chaos. And we're going to see this like, this is like a cycle. It's kind of, uh, over and over again in, in some of these parts of the world, uh, definitely in China. And the Sui dynasty comes in to pretty much kind of rebuild. Um, one of the one of the things that you can definitely write down as a, a major accomplishment of the Sui Dynasty was the uh, the building of the Grand Canal. All right, or I, I could technically get started during the Sui Dynasty. It's going to take a while for it to get finished up, um, but this is a a, a massive undertaking. Uh, building of a of a you know basically a human made canal uh, that ends up connecting the um, Yellow and Yangtze rivers, and uh, just comes this massive transportation artery, um, ends up making uh, just creating more of a political military uh, power and economic power uh, for for China, and uh, is is almost kind of like one of those little wonders of the world at its time. I mean, it's not really in much of a use anymore, but. The Grand Canal. You definitely want to uh, make some uh, some mention of that, okay? And uh, and and the building of that canal, getting that thing started, uh, kind of continues to build this this unity uh, that uh, the Sui Dynasty comes into uh, to deal with after uh, some of those issues with the uh, the Han Dynasty. One of the bigger issues being um, warlords. Uh, we'll be hearing about warlords uh, in a few different places as we uh, learn about. Uh, some of this earlier history. And, uh, you know, these are guys who just have their own little territories that they're in charge of and kind of are an obstacle to that unity because they have their land they control and they want to keep it that way. And, um, you know, if you want to try to create a, a, a government, a, a country that's going to have that strength and unity, uh, well, you got to get that out of the way. And uh, that's what happens during the Sui Dynasty. All right. Let's move on to the Tang Dynasty. And, um, for this one here, uh, really, they build on the Sui dynasty and, and expand the size of China. Uh, when you get right down to it, they just more territorial expansion. And uh, also a very inventive uh, dynasty. Uh, it's during that time frame that, kind of like you see the picture on the side there, we get the, uh, the invention of gunpowder. Uh, and, uh, and when, when first created, not created as a, a, you know, anything to be used for warfare, but for more for like, uh, celebrations, fireworks, that sort of thing. And then also what we consider nowadays kind of the modern day, um, incarnation of paper, uh, gets its, uh, beginnings during the Tang dynasty and the, the ability to make paper in, uh, in kind of more mass quantities, not like they're walking around with reams of it, that kind of thing, but, uh, finding easier methods for, for making, um, paper. All right, so a little bit about there about the Tang Dynasty, a little bit more about China. Um, let's see, it looks like I got my, my pictures a little bit out of order there because uh, it looks like uh, this gentleman here uh, popped up for Japan before Japan showed up. Oh, well, sometimes my pictures, it just works that way. So let's get a little bit about Japan. Okay, I haven't mentioned them. Um, one of the first things to uh, to jump up the and, and something that makes them very very different from China, all right? Uh, we'll, we'll we'll focus a lot on these different Asian countries and uh, and a lot of times, you know, people who are 
less intelligent, just kind of lump all Asian people together. And uh, oh no, no, when it comes to uh, cultural differences, political differences, oh my goodness, uh, it's just a myriad of, of differences uh, as we go from Japan to China to Korea down to uh, Southeast Asia, you know, Vietnam, places like that. And we'll be catching a little bit of all that as we uh, work through our units. Um, don't confuse, uh, confuse that, uh, that triangle you're looking at there with a the caste system. You got the picture there. You got the word. You, you got number one. That's a that's a depiction of the feudal system. Uh, this is something that will also be uh, used. A, a form of this will be eventually will be used in Europe. Um, but the uh, the Japanese are uh, making use of it uh, early on, and and basically how they're organizing their society. Okay, uh, basically kind of dividing people into these groups and. You know, up there at the top, and a lot of it is built. You know, with feudal systems, a lot of times there is this kind of uh, this concept of, of protection in exchange for service. You know, I'll do something for you, and you know, and, and usually that's people who are kind of down lower on this this uh, little little pyramid, and and they work and in exchange. The people who are above them protect them. All right, so you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put all my labor out for you. And in exchange, if you know any any bad dudes show up, you're you're gonna step in and, and protect me. That's kind of how the, what makes a feudal system operate. And uh, some of you who know a little bit, uh, especially some of you that had me for uh, for world studies, because we've got to dive a little deep into this, and you know learn about the uh, the shoguns and the samurai and you know kind of this warrior culture uh, that uh, that exists within Japan. Okay, all that going on. Uh, and then let's see, uh, well, let's throw a little more religion into the mix. Why not? Uh, in Japan, the uh, the Shinto religion is really the one that kind of uh, rules. Uh, somewhat similar, it's kind of um, I don't know Shinto. Shinto, I think it kind of translates into this kind of way of the gods. Um, is uh, is kind of the way, and, it, and it's kind of a it's kind of a weird mix. It's uh, it's polytheistic, but there's also a little bit of animism in there. Um, yeah, they get a little bit into some of the the nature worship, not the animals necessarily, but nature. And um, and the, according to their religious faith, there's elements of it that are similar to to China in terms of that that uh, worship of ancestors. You know that wanting to pay paying homage to you know those who came before you, and and that your conduct, you know, either brings honor or dishonor to your ancestors. There's some of that that goes on, and then part of the Shinto religion will will kind of infuse itself into the culture. Of Japan, and that is the you know it, the concept of that that the individual um, is not as important as the community, and just the idea that you know individual people in Japan are going to so basically subordinate themselves to the larger community. That is what is more important. Okay, is the you know the whole group, not your own individual. You know your sense of freedoms and rights and all that kind of thing, and so um, it kind of sets them a little bit apart from uh, the way that society. Uh, operates in uh, in China. Okay, um, let's flip it over here to Africa. Uh, really haven't dealt with the uh, the African continent uh, at all. Uh, first of all, um, chiefdom. So the way that we're, we're kind of structured here in terms of leadership and and even society, um, the the a lot of of parts of Africa operate off what we would call a kin based culture, and so it's a very much kind of kind of family units. And extended family. Uh, that's where we get that term kin based. And then uh, a lot of times the way they would organize these kin based cultures into what is to what we call chiefdoms. And, uh, and that's just a reference to the fact that usually a chief would be uh, at the head of all of this and uh, be recognized as, uh, as the leader. Okay, uh, Bantu, it's a, it's a cultural uh, identification, the Bantu people. And they're going to be a group that is going to uh, migrate through uh, through different parts of Africa, and um, and their their area of expertise, the Bantu, is is agriculture, um, farming, and uh, you know kind of the the kind of technologies and skills uh, that go into to farming. And so wherever they go, uh, they take that knowledge and that know how with them. Uh, but the Bantu, again, uh, worth mentioning because they're going to be a, a, a very dominant culture uh, through uh, parts of, of Africa. All right. Um, Ghana is, uh, is the name there. And this is going to be a, uh, a place uh, that establishes itself uh, in kind of, uh, kind of we're getting in here into 
um, you know, Western Africa, kind of a little more in the north and up there in, in Western Africa. And they are going to be really important to trade. You can tell by the little map there, you can see all these little red lines crisscrossing across the Sahara and, and that sort of thing. And those are trade routes, okay? Those are trade routes. And, um, and you're going to have these that, that go all the way across the Sahara to North Africa, and then from there uh, on to Asia, across the Indian Ocean, through you know, Southwest Asia, a.k.a. the Middle East, all that area in there. And, uh, and Ghana is, is kind of a hub uh, down here in Western Africa where a lot of this trade is going on. Uh, some ideas here that we will revisit again, because again, Africa is going to play um, a returning role with everything that we're going to be learning about in, uh, in AP World this year. Okay, and and um, that trade because a lot of the uh, merchants and tradesmen that are going to be crisscrossing back and forth to uh, these parts of Western Africa and then back over to the Middle East, they are going to bring these Middle Easterners are going to bring their faith with them, and uh, they're gonna they're gonna end up leaving some of that faith uh, in Western Africa, and so uh, over over the stretch of time we're gonna see Islam because that is will be the faith of most of those Middle Easterners. Uh, we will see Islam. Uh, establish itself in these western parts of, of Africa, and it is a direct result of the trade. Uh, just when you when you get that that cultural connection there, I mean, the trade is is just a business transaction, but there are going to always be these you know inadvertent uh, cultural connections, and sometimes when people are you know, introduced to, to new new ideas, like a, a faith that they're unfamiliar with. You know, the African people, they had their own traditional, uh, their own traditional religions, their own traditional faiths. But some of them uh, found it uh, sometimes for business reasons, sometimes for spiritual reasons, uh, worthy of converting to uh, to Islam. And so, uh, uh, and that is a fact that you see that in, in Africa to this very day, is uh, large, large parts of Africa that have a predominantly um, Islamic uh, worshiping population and uh, get started way back here in that post classical era. Okay. And then uh, let's see the great Zimbabwe um, is kind of like Ghana, another kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a kingdom of its own um, Ghana where it's connected to, uh, to the trade. Um, the Great Zimbabwe will be located more down kind of in Southeast Africa. And there will be some trade that goes across the Indian Ocean and connects with them as well. Uh, but another uh, another group, and you see the picture here, which is the, actually, the Great Zimbabwe. It's kind of a reference to this, almost kind of like this little fort-like settlement that you see here. Um, but uh, this will be another very dominant uh, civilization within Africa that has uh, a lot of influence and and some of it is, has to do with the uh, the artisans of uh, of great Zimbabwe and some of it has to do again with some of the the trade that will go on and some of those cross-cultural connections that come about as a result all right let's see um, quick look here at South and Southeast Asia another one that we've kind of been uh, kind of ignoring um, Yes, we're gonna we're gonna continue the trade theme and get used to it, folks. Strap in on this because holy cow, um, it's gonna it's gonna be a theme uh, that that rolls through most of the early units that we that we study. Some of them are, are about almost nothing but trade, um, and so with with Southeast Asia, um, they are kind of placed. You know, when we think about their let me get my mouse going. Um, when we think about their location. Um, they are perfectly placed because they're kind of right there through all these, these seagoing maritime trade routes that connect Asia to Southwest Asia, aka the Middle East, and Africa. And so they are going to be just kind of a hot spot uh, of trade. Some of them are going to have some of their own. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, kind of uh, crops uh, that uh, are harvested in some of Southeast Asia. Um, and and their their crops that uh, uh, the when, when harvested are refined into spices, so you know things like cinnamon, nutmeg, that kind of thing, and uh, they they are going to be high high demand trade goods. Uh, people in China are going to want them. They're going to be wanted in the Middle East eventually. That there's going to be demand coming from Europe, and uh, and Southeast Asia. Uh, is where you're going to be going to get those. So, uh, again, another area that is really built on that concept of trade. 
And, uh, oh, excuse me there. Holy cow. Um, and the way that faith will operate in Southeast Asia is truly kind of, I, I think it's kind of fascinating because it is a total reflection of the fact that trade brought people from all these different parts of the known world back then. So it's bringing Middle Easterners who are coming in with, you know, Islam, uh, their Muslim faith. You're going to have uh, traders coming in from, you know, from China with Confucianism. You're going to have traders coming in from South Asia with Buddhism and Hinduism. And, um, and you really are going to get this full on mix. Uh, of, of religious faiths in Southeast Asia. The most predominant of those I just listed for you, Buddhism is going to make massive headway and uh, gain a lot of converts. Uh, Hinduism will, will do the same, uh, probably in a secondary position, and then Islam, okay? And in these trade spots where there, there, a lot of this goes on, a lot of times, you know, the, the people who are native to that land, they will convert to a faith because it, they believe it will give them a business advantage. You know, if I convert to the Muslim faith, uh, then these these merchants and traders who are coming with all kinds of cool goods from the Middle East will be more willing to do business with me because we are of the same faith. It's got that kind of thinking, right? I think that's a uh, concept and idea that we'll revisit later. All right, and we're going to finish this off with Europe. All right, and uh, we're going to look at it a couple of different ways. What's going on in Europe? Well, Europe is a mess. Let's just put it that way. You know, while we have, uh, you know, the creation of empires, whether it's, you know, the Gupta, whether it's the dynasties in China and, um, you know, and, and the rise of all these kingdoms going on in Africa, um, you know, and, and, and then, you know, I mean, the, the Persian Empire, you know, all these places in the world where there's just all this kind of, wow, things are like moving. Um, Europe is just this ununified, chopped up, uh, just, well, it's kind of a mess, okay? Uh, fiefdoms is pretty much what we see rule through most of Europe. And these are just like small little kingdoms. You know, you've got a person who um, probably has been born into some kind of wealth. And so they have a chunk of land that they get to call their own. They probably have a bunch of peasants, uh, serfs, uh, they're called, uh, who are working for them and, uh, you know, working farms, agriculture, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and and the, the entire continent of, of Europe is kind of just just crisscrossed with these, okay? You don't have big countries or big empires. Uh, it, fiefdoms, king, little kingdoms is, is pretty much the, uh, the, the way that, the, that most of Europe operates. And yeah, a lot of times, you know, there's little conflicts that break out between them. You know, you might have one of these uh, people ruling over one of these that wants to expand their territory and, you know, ends up going to war with a, a nearby fiefdom and yeah, that kind of business going on. All right. Uh, religiously, Europe is, uh, by the time we get to the post-classical era, is, is pretty, pretty solid in terms of uh, the, the inroads that Christianity has made. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to say it's 100 percent, but it is it is very strong and it's growing through this time period. All right. Um, the Holy Roman Empire uh, ends up being established kind of central Europe. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like there's parts of present day Germany, parts of present day France. Of course, these don't really exist as, as any kind of, you know, entities back then, because again, we're kind of stuck in the era of fiefdoms. Uh, the picture you see over there on the side, that is, uh, uh, his name was Charlemagne. And uh, he was, uh, I think they're amongst the, one of the first kings of the, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, given that title by by the Pope himself, right? And uh, you got him there in his uh, official portrait. And you know, some of you remember, especially you World Studies folks, he is gripping the holy hand grenade. All right. The rest of you, we'll, we'll catch you up to that one someday. Uh, but um, yeah, he's got that uh, got that rocking along with his with his sword. Uh, we got a little religious power on display there, and we got a little bit of military power on display with there. So, kind of a kind of a strange little juxtaposition, isn't it? You know, uh, the symbol of love and the symbol of death. But uh, that's how they're rocking it back then. All right, the Great Schism. All right, Schism. When you think of the word Schism, think of this little yummy dish right here, because many of you will probably very quickly be able to identify that as a banana split. All right, and that's what the Great Schism is. Uh, that is when um, basically uh, Christians, and, and this is predominantly, we're talking about uh, 
kind of Catholics, but it, it goes beyond just the Catholic Church, but the split in Christianity that, that takes place in the year 1054. And, um, and what you're going to end up having is what you see on the map here. And that is going to be uh, Catholicism kind of being the predominant Christian faith in Western Europe, Central and Western Europe. And then uh, the Orthodox Church, which uh, is still a, a form of Christianity, uh, but worships in a different way. Right. And they are going to establish themselves in uh, pretty much what you see over here. Everything kind of, you know, Eastern Europe into present day Russia and uh, then even drifting down into Southwest Asia. OK. And the uh, that uh, the Orthodox Church. So uh, we go from having just kind of, you know, one one Catholic church, one, you know, major base for Christianity, you know, the Pope, all that kind of thing. But with the Great Schism. We have this divide. And while the Pope is still going to reign and have influence over here in Western Europe, um, the Orthodox Church will have its own leaders and its own kind of structure. Uh, again, there's, there's, there's similarities between the faiths, but also a lot of differences. All right. And let's see, where do we finish off? Oh, the Crusades. That's where we finish off. Deus vult, God wills it. Uh, that is um, all kinds of, of, of reasons why um, it's believed that the, uh, the Crusades came about and what the Crusades were for those of you, uh, uninitiated, um, this is when the Pope makes a call, uh, this time the, uh, the Holy Lands, um, you know, and we're, we're getting down into, uh, uh, down into the Middle East, um, you know, what had been Canaan, the land of, of the Jewish people, uh, had been under Roman control for a while. Well, by, by 1095, it's under, uh, Islamic control. Okay. Uh, again, we, you know, we have, we have the, the, the Muslim faith as well established by 1095. Um, by then it's about, uh, what, four or 500 years old. And, uh, and that the faith has been spread far and wide and the Holy lands are under the control of Muslims. And, uh, the Pope makes a call for good Christians to march on down to the Middle East and to, uh, to free the Middle East, uh, from the, from the Muslims. And uh, this, this ends up being a series of, of crusades where uh, people from uh, Europe uh, pretty much, you know, kiss the wife and kids goodbye and, and march down to the Middle East and uh, kind of fight these uh, back and forth battles. For a while, the Christians regain control of the Middle East. Then the Muslims pull it back away and it's back and it's forth and it's back and it's forth. And um, by the time the crusades uh, come to, a, to an ultimate end, um, the Muslims retain control of the Holy Lands. Uh, they kind of strike a deal and they allow Christians to hang out down there if they want. Um, you know, it's pretty much just to say, hey, you're just, you're just not going to try to convert us to your Christianity. Let us do our thing. You do your thing. And uh, we can we can live happily here together. And so uh, you know, a little bit of that. Um, one of the kind of kind of probably unintentional consequences of the Crusades is that these crusaders going down into the Middle East, uh, thinking they're going to go fight against these, you know, these infidels, these non-believers, um, actually find a Middle East that in a lot of ways is technologically more advanced than Europe that they marched from. And so some of that exposure uh, to some of the uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, learning, some of the technologies that, uh, that Middle Easterners had been developing, Muslims, uh, some of that will end up uh, being packed up and, and taken back to Europe uh, with some of these crusaders as they uh, head their way back home. All right. Uh, so, boom, there you go. I think that gets us to, uh, to the completion. Yes, there it is. We are completed with unit zero. Nula. All right. All right. And I did that in less than 30 minutes. Well, you know how I get going on these notes. Okay. All right. That's got you. Um, and uh, if you got any questions on any of this, uh, you bring those questions with you uh, on Monday and uh, we'll deal with them in class. All right. I'm out. See ya.